you're listening to FBC Radio on 16.9. church and community today is sunday the 19th of april 2020 and what an interesting day it is in history because on this day in 1770 captain cook wrote in his journal that for the first time on his journey in the endeavor he spotted australia Also on this day in 1910, it was the first time in the 20th century that Halley's Comet could be seen with the naked eye. So today is a day when people looked up at the vastness of space and looked all around them at the horizon of the sea and they saw and discovered things for the very first time. Now it's possible that by now you are getting rather fed up with looking at the same environment around you every day. And maybe you're getting bored following the same routine every day. If so, why not make this week a week of discovery? There are so many things that we don't know. So why not this week choose to find out something that you currently do not know? Do some research online. Pick up a book that's in your house that might have the answer to your question in it. Or phone a friend. Why not find a dictionary and learn seven new words this week, one every day? Or why not create a quiz for somebody else and send it to them so that they can discover new things? If you haven't heard it already yet, then why not get up early and listen to the dawn chorus as the birds greet a brand new day of God's creation? And what about that desire that you've often sung about during Sunday services where you want to know God more and what about that intention that you've had to read God's word more what better time than now to discover more about God and what he has said in his word and how we can put it into action in and through our lives to be of benefit to us and to others let's make this a week when we discover new things and appreciate the things that we so often take for granted let us pray together Lord, at this time, when our surroundings may seem so familiar to us, where every day may seem to be the same as the previous one, Lord, may today be a day of discovering new things, a day of great appreciation for what has always been there, but perhaps we just haven't seen it or never really appreciated it. Open our eyes, Lord, to the wonders of your creation. Open our eyes, Lord, to the beauty of one another. And open our eyes, Lord, to see just how great and wonderful you are, that we may celebrate this day and discover you afresh this week. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Dave and the Children's Band are going to lead us now in some worship, celebrating what God has done for us through Jesus.
And a great bit of news to start off family news this week, and that's to say congratulations to Helen and Benjamin on the birth of their baby, Dominic. Our love and prayers go to you all, and especially to Dominic. Welcome to the family of Frimley Baptist Church. And because I can't think of anything better to announce than the birth of a newborn child, that brings us to the end of this week's... Family News! Corinne is now going to lead us in prayer. Lord, as we come to pray, we thank you that you do not change, that your love, kindness and grace are the same yesterday, today and forevermore. May we enter your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise. Father, we thank you that we can meet virtually today and that technology has enabled many people to attend virtual services, to listen to Christian services in, over the radio and in other ways. In a time when many are looking for hope, may those who are listening know your truth. We thank you for all of those who have put together these services and for the new skills that many people have learnt. We thank you that many people have been able to listen to the Spring Harvest Talks from their homes. May they be touched by what they have heard. Please continue to give inspiration to those providing these services and may they be guided by your Spirit. Lord, Help us to remember in these times that you are our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in troubled times. Father, we pray for those across the world who have been and continue to be affected by the coronavirus. Grant healing and peace, and that we all may know the steadfast love of you, our God. We pray for those who are vulnerable or fearful at this time. For those who are isolating alone, and for those isolating in difficult or even dangerous circumstances, we pray for vulnerable children and adults, that they may be protected. For those in abusive households where the problems have been increased by lockdown, we ask that they may know your peace, and know that you are the light in the darkness. We pray for those with physical or medical needs in the community, especially those with dementia and learning difficulties, who may feel confused at this time. May we be generous, kind and wise in the ways that we help. We pray for wisdom and protection for church and community projects who are working to meet these needs. We pray for those with limited access to technology, which can increase feelings of loneliness and isolation. Help them to reach out for help and support. Be close to those in hospital at this time, as they cannot see family and friends. Give them your comfort, peace and healing. We thank you for the continued healing of our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. We pray for those women who are due to give birth in the next few months. Let them know that you are with them. And we ask that they may be able to have a birth partner present. We pray for those grieving alone or cannot attend the funeral of a loved one. We thank you especially for the life of Phil Ashford bless his family we pray as they grieve. We pray for medical staff and other key workers. May they feel valued and supported. Protect them physically, mentally and spiritually. Please give them wisdom and grant them good rest when they are not working. We pray for the provision of personal protective equipment for all those who need it to minimise risks. We thank you for the new Nightingale Hospital and other locations around the country. We pray for the staff that will be working in these locations 
and pray for the services and care that will be offered there. Father, we pray for our world leaders and our government. May they seek godly wisdom and justice as they make decisions. May their decisions protect the most vulnerable in society. We pray for those who are working to alleviate symptoms of the coronavirus and to ultimately find a vaccine. Give them protection and wisdom, we pray. We thank you for those who are supporting those who are on the margins of society, including the Remember the Poor Fund, the Salvation Army, the All Night Cafe, the Hope Hub, and the Phyllis Tuckwell Hospice. Give them vision and inspiration of how to do this in these challenging times. Lord, do not let us forget the positive things, including a stronger sense of community for many, looking after one another's needs, and an opportunity to be thankful and to experience the simple things in life. We rejoice in your greatness and power, your gentleness and love, your mercy and justice. Enable us by your Spirit to honour you in our thoughts and words and deeds, and to serve you in every aspect of our lives, today and every day. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In just a few moments we're going to share in communion together, so if you have some wine or juice or bread to hand, I would encourage you to have that ready. As we prepare to take communion, Sarah is going to lead us in a song that reminds us of the faithfulness of the Lord and the stability that he offers, which is something on which we can depend.
Today we gather for this time of communion in an unfamiliar way. But whilst we are scattered, we are gathered together in Jesus' name. As we break bread and drink this cup together, we remember that we are part of something far bigger than what is in our homes and far bigger than even when we meet in our church building. We are part of a worldwide church where this meal is a familiar one, reminding us of the time spent in an upper room as the disciples gathered with Jesus on the night before his death, before any of them knew of the hope of the resurrection. On that night, Jesus had in mind not just those who were gathered around his table, but also he was thinking of us gathered around ours. In John's account of the Last Supper, he records in chapter 17 a prayer that Jesus prayed after the supper before he went to the Garden of Gethsemane. After praying for his disciples to be protected, he is recorded as saying these words in verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. As we gather today, scattered in the community, with those who we know well and those who we do not know well, in Jesus' name, in answer to his prayer, we become one. Let us pray and give thanks. We gather here, gracious God, struggling with being separate, but glad for this opportunity to be together. We thank you for your perfect sacrifice. We thank you for your amazing love. We thank you for paying the price for our sin and offering us forgiveness in your name. We thank you for this bread and for this wine on different tables, in different cups, on different plates, in different places, but all symbols of your broken body and your blood poured out for us. The Apostle Paul teaches the church that everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup, so that their heart is right towards God and towards one another, and if not, to confess that and seek to put it right. So let's have a moment of quiet prayer as we reflect and we examine ourselves, and where necessary, bring to God our prayers of confession. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At this point, please take the bread, and if you are with others, please distribute it to them, and let's eat the bread as we receive it, with thanksgiving. Remembering that Christ calls us to be his follower, he welcomes us as his friend. He calls us his family and he invites us to become part of his story. In the same way after supper he took the cup, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. At this point, please take the cup, and if you're with others, please distribute it to them, but hold on to the cup for a moment so we can drink it together. Though we drink from many cups today, we remember that in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each belongs to all the others. Drink and remember that Christ died for you. He offers you forgiveness. He calls you his own and he restores your soul. 
Let's drink together, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. From where we are to where you need us, Jesus now lead on. From the familiarity of what we know to the wonder of what you will reveal, Jesus now lead on. To transform the fabric of this world until it resembles the shape of your kingdom, Jesus now lead on. Because good things have been prepared for those who love God, Jesus now lead on. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon us and remain with us and with those who we love this day and forevermore. Amen. Before Jill speaks to us, Tony's going to read from God's Word. Psalm 23, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The times we are living in have been labelled unprecedented, and I'm sure it's a word we have all been using in connection to our changed circumstances. However, until recently, it's not a word I have used very often. In fact, when I wanted to look up the definition of unprecedented, I wasn't quite sure how to spell it. According to the Cambridge English Dictionary, unprecedented refers to something never having happened or existed in the past. Some might argue that there have been similar flu-like epidemics in previous times, which is true, but none have happened in the same way or in the same culture as we live in today, and none perhaps have had the same global impact. At the beginning of 2020, I wonder if, like us, you were making plans for this year. We were looking ahead and thinking about holidays, my father-in-law's 90th birthday celebration in July, and a family wedding in August. Little did we know that so much would change in such a short space of time. In line with the imagery of Psalm 23, perhaps we took the green pastures and still waters of life in 21st century Great Britain for granted and didn't realise that before long we might be walking through the darkest valley or a valley of the shadow of death. Our lives seemed so settled and secure and then suddenly that security was shaken by a deadly virus leading to a dramatic change to our freedom and the way we live our lives. Today, I want to look at Psalm 23 to help us to gain insights into how we might live during these unprecedented times. We have all been asked to stay at home to keep us safe and to preserve our physical health. But this very necessity may be affecting us mentally, emotionally and spiritually. Psalm 23 is probably one of the most well-known and well-loved psalms and has brought comfort to many over the years. King David, the author of Psalm 23, certainly knew what it was like to live through unprecedented times, and he knew what it was like to run in fear for his life. He knew emotional, mental and physical distress, 
and yet through it all he trusted that God would bring him through. King David starts Psalm 23 by imagining his Lord as a shepherd. David was an experienced shepherd himself and so this was an easy link for him to make. He uses the words, the Lord is my shepherd, which suggests an intimate relationship between David and his Lord. In other Psalms, David uses more distant images to describe his relationship with God, such as the king or deliverer. But in Psalm 23, there is the intimate picture of the shepherd living with his flock. The shepherd is with his flock and is everything the flock needs, the guide, the physician and the protector. This intimate relationship is echoed in the New Testament when Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd. In John chapter 10 verse 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. It is a close and personal relationship. The sheep listen to and recognise the shepherd's voice and he calls them by name. In John 10 verse 11, we read that the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And over Easter in particular, we remembered that Jesus gave his life for us and died in our place on the cross. I have divided this message into three parts. First of all, I want to look at God's faithfulness and provision in the past. Then, at God's presence in the present and finally God's promise for the future. So first of all, God's faithfulness and provision in the past. In the first few verses of Psalm 23, David describes what it's like for a sheep to live with the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. The sheep lack nothing because the shepherd provides for all their needs. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. The sheep lie down and rest in a fertile and relaxing place. And the picture is one of peace and tranquility. As we picture this scene, some of us may be feeling peaceful but I wonder if some of us are feeling anything but peaceful. Many of us may be feeling anxious and afraid. We may be filled with fear for the present and the future. We may be afraid of the unknown because none of us know what will be the outcome of this unprecedented time. One thing we can do to help us is to look back and remember God's provision and faithfulness in the past and use this as evidence on which to base our confidence that he will provide for us and be faithful towards us now and in the future. When we go through a difficult time, we all have choices and being aware of this can help us to make the best choice. We can choose to see our present circumstances as hopeless with no way out and forget the fact that God has never failed us yet. Or we can choose to remember that God has been faithful to us in the past and has never let us down. We can therefore rely upon this evidence to trust him in the present difficult time. I remember some years ago I faced a choice when as a family we were going through a difficult time and I was really struggling. My eyes were focused on the impossibility of the situation and in my mind God seemed so far away and uncaring. This lack of trust and unbelieving attitude did me no favours, I can tell you. I was anxious, afraid, stressed and very angry with God for not answering my prayers and for letting me down. In fact, I was thoroughly miserable. I remember one day during this time painting a room in our house 
And as I painted, I used the brush and roller to express my frustration and anger to God. As I slapped on the paint, I told God exactly how I felt and that I felt he'd let me down. It was very therapeutic, I can tell you. You may be shocked when you hear about my behaviour, but God is so much bigger than our fear and anger. And he is gracious and merciful when we come to him just as we are. Not very long after this painting incident, the seemingly impossible situation we were in began to change. And I saw God's faithfulness and miracle working power in action to heal and restore. Of course, then I was ashamed of my behaviour and lack of trust. And I confessed my unbelief to God and he restored me. I learnt a lesson during that time. I can choose to trust the evidence of God's faithfulness in the past, or I can choose to look at the present circumstances and worry and be afraid. From my experience, when I didn't trust God, I was the one who suffered. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In other words, keep trusting God even when you don't understand what is happening and trust God for the solution and not yourself. We don't know what's going to happen in the next few weeks and months, but we do know the shepherd who provides in every way for his sheep. In Psalm 23, verse 3, David says that the Lord refreshes or restores his soul. My understanding of the soul is that it is the spiritual part of us that relates to God and is at the very centre of our being. So what does restore our soul mean? When you restore something, you return it to where it was or what it was before. I don't know if any of you have watched the TV programme, The Repair Shop. It's become very popular recently. In this programme, expert craft people use their talents to restore heirlooms and treasures to their former glory. Objects that have got worn and a bit battered are restored and made useful and beautiful again. I wonder if just as those objects get restored, this is a time when our souls can get restored. You may wonder how that can be done. I said at the beginning that many of us may have been feeling secure at the beginning of 2020, but then that security was shattered. I wonder what we were basing our security on. Our good health, our jobs and financial security, our homes and our families, the routines and things that we do each day that we expected would just carry on the same. Perhaps the coronavirus will cause us to question where our security comes from. Perhaps it's time to refocus our security on Jesus, who is the same yesterday, today and forever, and who, who will never let us down. Our souls may have got a bit battered, and they need to be reset and renewed. Also, many of us now have extra time to pray, listen to worship songs and read our Bibles. We may have been happily wandering along at the back of the flock far from the shepherd, but perhaps now we have time to draw near to him and to be restored. Next, I want to look at God's presence in the present. The psalmist says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me for you are with me. We are not going through this valley on our own for the Lord is with us. I don't know about you, but I would feel much safer walking through somewhere scary with someone else rather than being on my own. 
However, the psalmist is not just saying that we have any old companion as we go through the valley of the shadow of death, but rather we have an amazing companion. He is the one who said in Matthew 28, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. What a difference this companion makes. We may be feeling isolated and alone, but God is no respecter of walls or boundaries, and he is with us wherever we are by his Holy Spirit. We not only have God's presence with us, but we also have his protection. David says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod described here was probably like a cudgel, which the shepherd used as a weapon to protect his sheep from other animals. The staff was like a crook, which the shepherd used to guide his sheep in the right direction, so that they didn't wander off and come to harm. So in the valley of the shadow of death, the shepherd had the right tools to keep the flock safe. Our shepherd, King Jesus, has defeated our enemies on the cross and has sent his Holy Spirit to comfort and guide us. We do not need to be afraid when he is with us. Having God's presence with us at this unprecedented time is the most important factor for our well-being. But there are also some things that we can do to protect and help ourselves. First of all, we can exercise. The government has recognised that exercise is very important as an aid to people's well-being and has recommended that if possible, we all take some exercise every day. It is interesting that in Psalm 23, David talks about lying and resting in the green pastures, but then walking through the valley. It's not safe to stay in the valley, and so it's good to keep on moving to get through it. It's not surprising that there is a general spirit of fear and anxiety at the moment, and this can be heightened by the isolation that many of us are experiencing. In normal circumstances, fear is a useful emotion and is necessary to keep us safe. Fear triggers the release of adrenaline in response to a threat. When that threat is continuous and goes on for a period of time, just as in these unprecedented times, adrenaline keeps pumping out and around our bodies, but has nowhere to go. Exercise helps to use up this adrenaline and will help us to feel less stressed. Any form of exercise is beneficial. Even just moving around a room is better than sitting still all day. The second way we can protect ourselves is to guard our thoughts. Paul advises in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 that we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Our thinking underpins everything we feel and do. Put simply, if we think that everything is going well, we are more likely to feel positive and happy and to do things that enhance our well-being. If we think that everything is going wrong, we will behave accordingly and feel anxious and depressed. A lot of the news at the moment is bad news. And I have found that if I spend a lot of time watching, reading or listening to it, it can really influence how I think and feel. So in order to guard my thoughts, I am choosing to limit the amount of news I am exposed to. Instead, I am trying to fill my thoughts with positive things, as Paul writes in Philippians 4 verse 8. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Thinking about positive things will help us to feel more positive. 
In fact, going for a walk and looking out for the signs of spring and nature around us combines exercise with thinking about positive things. The third way we can protect ourselves and others is to be careful of what we say. I was in a shop a few weeks ago before the lockdown and got into a conversation with one of the shop workers and another customer. The conversation seemed to deteriorate until it became like a competition over who had heard the worst news regarding the coronavirus. I came out of that shop feeling quite shocked and decided that from then on that if I heard any bad news, I was going to guard my mouth and not share it with anyone. There is enough bad news around at the moment without me adding to it. Ephesians 4.29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Let us try and encourage each other by what we say, and thereby we will be making those around us feel better. The fourth way we can help ourselves is to be grateful. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18 we read, Give thanks in all circumstances. As we wash our hands for the required 20 seconds, perhaps we can take the opportunity to think of our many blessings and to thank God for them. Even just having clean water to wash with is such a tremendous blessing. And the fifth way we can protect ourselves is to connect with other people. I have already mentioned how much better I would feel being in a scary place if someone else was with me. All of us can reach out to others and help them navigate through this unprecedented time. It makes such a difference to know you are not alone. There are so many ways of connecting today. We can ring, text, FaceTime, email and the list goes on. Don't wait for others to contact you. Take the initiative and contact them. This is a way of sharing God's love during this difficult time. Finally, I want to consider God's promise for the future. The last few verses in Psalm 23 talk about God preparing a table for us. The commentary suggests that the imagery changes here from the shepherd and the sheep to the host and the guest because sheep probably would find it difficult to sit at a table. In the world of the Old Testament, to eat and drink at someone's table created a bond of mutual loyalty. To be God's guest is to be more than an acquaintance. It is to live with him and to have journeyed home. This meal symbolises the threat being turned into a triumph with even greater intimacy as, as God has gone to the trouble of preparing it especially for us. The valley of the shadow of death has been successfully navigated and the guest has arrived at their destination. There is abundance at this well-set table with festive oil and a brimming cup anticipating a victory celebration. There is also the echo of the Last Supper with Jesus the host preparing the table and giving himself for us. His death turned into victory as he triumphed over the cross. And this is the crux of everything. We do not need to fear these unprecedented times because God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We do not need to fear the valley of the shadow of death because he has promised that if we believe in him we will have eternal life. Psalm 139 verse 16 says, 
all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. We do not need to fear because our lives are in God's hands anyway and that is the safest place for us to be. The last verse in Psalm 23 says, Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The promise for the future is that we will live in God's house with him. Jesus said in John 14, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. So in conclusion, in these unprecedented times, we might be feeling afraid and imagining all the worst things that might happen. But the Lord is my shepherd and he is your shepherd. He is with us in these difficult times and he will walk with us as we go through them. God has been faithful and provided for us in the past. God is always present with us. And the promise that God has for the future is that we will dwell in his house forever. I pray that the words of Psalm 23 may bring comfort to you all in the coming days.
brings us to the end of today's broadcast. I hope you can join with us again next Sunday. May the Lord, your shepherd, truly bless you this week. You've been listening to FBC Radio on 16.9. 